Um, I am going to now take it to um, Dr. Gordon Nemhart. Um, Dr. Nemhart, can you speak a little bit towards um, towards some of the history of cooperatives, and then where you see them, where you see this movement towards worker cooperatives going in the future? Absolutely. Thanks. Um, I guess it's good morning to you guys. Good morning. Oh, I'd like to start with actually acknowledging the original owners of the land, those who have toiled over the centuries without just compensation, and those who have been using co-ops and alternative economics for liberation. The research I've done, and I've published some of it, uh, a lot of it, in the book Collective Courage, the research I've done shows that we have a long and continuous history, particularly in the black community, but probably in, in other subaltern communities, of using cooperatives as not just a survival strategy, but a liberation strategy. And so, the, the Jackson Project actually, you know, is just continuing this legacy. In fact, in the 60s, there was a, a, a group called the Poor People's Corporation in Jackson. It actually had 800 members and created about um, 13 producer co-ops and other co-ops, again, and, and a similar idea to what we're doing now in Corporation Jackson. Uh, Corporation Jackson is calling their urban farm Freedom Farm, and that's a name that Fannie Lou Hamer, who many of you may know from her voting rights and SNCC activism, but in the last years of her life, she actually created Freedom Farm in Bowlville, which was a collective farm also connected to affordable housing and some worker co-ops, and the notion there was to own our own land, first produce our own food, to keep housing affordable so that we have uh, an economic base to then fight for our other, um, for our civil and political rights. So that we needed that kind of economic base. There have been lots of other examples throughout history. Pretty much every civil rights and black liberation organization in history in the U.S. have um, either practiced or proposed cooperative economics as a strategy, as an important strategy, often in periods like the 1880s, the 1930s, and 40s, and the 1960s and 70s. Black co-ops were really prolific, partly because of the economic conditions, and we needed co-ops for survival, but also because co-ops were connected to um, strong grassroots movements that said, if we don't own our own land, control our own economy, that we then we can't move forward with any other activity and that we need to do it together because the point is to let the whole race prosper, not just to let a few people make it and the rest of us flounder, that we need all of us to make it together. Um, the, uh, it's interesting to see how uh, throughout history the populism radical change, unionization, and co-ops have all kind of been connected, especially in the early 1880s, sorry, in the mid-1800s, and particularly the 1880s, those three movements actually uh, grew up together. It was only because of racism and the assertion of monopoly capital that they got separated by the 20th century. we have seen them all as separate issues. But in the black community, those connections have pretty much stayed so that by the 30s and 40s, you have the young Negroes cooperatively getting young people involved in doing co-op development. But you also have the first official black independent union in the 20th century. The Mothers of the Sleeping Park Quarters also telling the members to uh, think about uh, consumer cooperatives and economic cooperation as a way keep the hard-earned union dollars from the porters flowing in the black community and helping to strengthen the black community and helping um, to solve all the other economic issues. So creating credit unions, co-op stores, etc. Even though they had good union jobs, this notion that we had to give back to the community and using co-ops was a way to do that. Um, another example I'd like to talk about is freedom quilting, which is uh, 
from the late 60s uh, on into the 20th century, actually, a group of sharecropping women started selling quilts and then making quilts together to sell and formed a co-op. And that actually enabled some of those families to get off of the sharecropping. They were able to buy land for their sewing uh, factory. That land ownership allowed them to help other members of the community to get off of sharecropping, especially during that time sharecroppers were being evicted from their property because they're registering to vote and participating in civil rights. So again, those connections between we need to own our own land, have our own economic independence in order to fight um, and advocate for ourselves and fight for our rights. Um, that co-op was able to actually solve other community problems like they had enough money to put in a daycare center, an after-school program, summer programs for children, so that um, the women's need for income for their families, they're gaining that income through the um, through the quilts, and then their ability to use that income to create independence and to do things for their community, all are examples of the ways that co-ops have been able to connect all these different pieces, similar to what Jackson is talking about now. So I know I just mentioned it, so I think I'm going to wrap up with lessons learned and where, we, where things are moving now. So a lot of the lessons learned are these connections, so connection between economic independence, land ownership, um, economic stability, and advocacy, and ability to argue for your rights only from a position of some kind of economic strength that requires group, a group to practice group economics. Also, the need for education. Every co-op that I've found in my history started with a study group or some kind of um, coming together to talk about the issues to understand the co-op model and then to use uh, what they were learning from the co-op model to apply it not just to their business development in the co-op but to other things in their community and how important continuous education is uh, Policy advocacy also make it clear that there are policies that will support and help co-op development, having strong organizations, those periods of the strongest black co-ops are also periods of very strong black organizations that promoted co-op development, promoted liberation and independence, and so that, again, that connection between um, not just individual groups doing this, but strong uh, national and regional groups promoting it. And then the need for finance. Um, the sad part of this history is there has been a lot of financial and physical sabotage and terrorism against blacks doing these alternatives. Um, and so the need for alternative financing, for separate financing, has been important as well. I think the areas that are really interesting these days, the most growth I've seen lately are interest in worker co-ops, um, which, you know, really give workers much more control over their lives and give them an asset as part of their um, ownership in the co-op. They're actually an asset owner. Business equity is actually one of the main pieces of people's wealth portfolios. The worker co-ops provide both good jobs, but also this equity, asset ownership. And those are growing, particularly in communities of color, especially among urban immigrant groups. And the other thing that we're looking at now is trying to use co-ops for um, re-entry for returning citizens, as well as in prisons, since you know, um, Prisons are the only place where slavery is actually allowed still in the Constitution. So trying to figure out <clears throat> how to use co-ops to be more liberatory and to, be, to provide more dignified work control of the work, be more liberatory in uh, incarceration area, and then to provide more options for people in the entry. So I'd say those are the areas we're looking at for more, more growth. And um, also, I think, connecting the history. So I was able to do the African American history. There's a history for Latinos, there's a history for Native Americans, there's a history for Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders. Connecting all those histories so we all see that subaltern groups have these legacies of working out both the survival and the social justice piece through these kinds of collective ownership and cooperative ownership, I think is important and that will be another, I think, great step that we'll make um, in the next few years is connecting those issues better. 
So I'll stop there. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Dr. Gordon and Hart. Thank you.